Welcome to the distinguished lecture series of the Indian Mathematics Consortium. The aim here is to host virtual colloquia by some of the best researchers and expositors around the world. The speakers are carefully chosen by the scientific committee from among mathematicians who are not only distinguished researchers but are also known for the quality of their exposition. The principal aim here is to make the talks as widely accessible as possible, especially to PhD students. With this in view, the format of most of the talks will be in two stages. First, there will be a pre-recorded talk by the speaker, which will be posted online. Interested audience can then view this at their leisure and communicate questions, if any, to the organizers. The second stage will be a live interactive session between the speaker and interested participants and that will be held about two weeks after posting the online talk. The approximate duration of the talk will be about 45 minutes and that of the interactive session will be about half an hour. The Distinguished Lecture Series is co-hosted by IIT Bombay and ICTS Bangalore. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Jay Kumar Radhakrishnan. We are very happy to have Professor Noga Alon give the next lecture in the Distinguished Lecture Series of the Indian Mathematics Consortium. Professor Alon is Professor of Mathematics at Princeton University and a Baum Ritter Professor Emeritus of Mathematics and Computer Science at Tel Aviv University, Israel. For almost four decades, Professor Alon has been a very influential researcher in the areas of combinatorics, graph theory, and theoretical computer science. His interests include extremal graph theory and its applications, the investigation of de-randomization techniques, the foundations of streaming algorithms, the development and applications of algebraic and probabilistic methods in discrete mathematics, and the study of problems in information theory, combinatorial geometry, and combinatorial number theory. Professor Alon has made several groundbreaking contributions to these areas. For example, the currently thriving study of expander graphs, which is carried out through the study of their eigenvalue spectrum, owes much to Professor Alon's seminal works in the 1980s. His contributions have been recognized through a number of prizes and awards, including the Erdős Prize, the Poya Prize, the Gödel Prize, the Israel Prize, and the Paris Kanalakis Award. Apart from his over 500 research papers, Professor Alon has, along with Professor Joel Spencer, written a magisterial and wonderfully accessible book called The Probabilistic Method, which received the 2021 Steel Prize for Mathematical Exposition. Professor Alon will speak to us today on the necklace problem, a classical problem in combinatorics which has been traditionally approached through topological methods, some of which Professor Alon himself invented several decades ago. Today's talk will shine probabilistic and algorithmic light on this problem and bring into view several of its less seen facets. I welcome Professor Alon and thank him for taking the time to speak to us. Over to you, Professor Alan. Okay, uh, so uh, it's a, a great pleasure to have this opportunity to speak here. And uh, this is being recorded, uh, so I have no idea uh, who exactly will uh, actually watch it eventually, but, uh, but let me thank you uh, anyway for, uh, for watching it. Uh, uh, I'll be speaking about the necklace uh, theorem, and I like this uh, topic because it combines uh, combinatorics, uh, probability, geometry, topology, and algorithms, uh, and actually just a little bit of each of them, and I'll try to convince you that uh, this is uh, interesting. And the new results uh, are based on uh, uh, two recent uh, papers, uh, 
the a first of them is a, a joint work with a Andre a. Grauer, whom you see a, here. So he was a student in Princeton and he's now in a Stanford. And the other paper a, is a joint work in a progress, but a, hopefully a nearly final. We say a door Helvoim, uh, whom you see a uh, juggling here uh, from Princeton, a uh, Janusz Pach from uh, uh, Budapest and uh, Moscow, and Gabor Tardos uh, from Budapest. So uh, let me start with uh, some deterministic results. Uh, and, uh, and maybe I'll start with uh, uh, early motivation. Uh, so there have been uh, uh, some old cake cutting problems of Steinhaus, but uh, another result suggested by Steinhaus and uh, proved by uh, Banach around the same time, which is uh, uh, even better known, is a, a ham sandwich theorem. So uh, this uh, basically says that uh, if we have B nice probability measures in RB, and nice can be a absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, then there is always a hyperplane that bisects all of them. So these are early results for finding fair partitions with respect to different measures uh, where the partition is of some prescribed uh, type. And as I said, uh, this was uh, approved by uh, Banach. Uh, and uh, uh, the original formulation in Steinhaus' uh, paper from 38, where he attributes a uh, proof to uh, Banach, the proof uh, was by reduction to the Bohr's Ulam theorem, talks about uh, putting a ham sandwich in a meat cutter. And what we want is to uh, bisect exactly the meat, the fat, and the bone with one slice of the cutter. And uh, uh, there have been uh, lots of uh, variants and extensions uh, of this result. Uh, there is a recent uh, survey by Edgardo Roydan Pensado and Pablo Sobron. Uh, and this survey of uh, result, partition results of, uh, of this type, uh, uh, with a focus uh, on results with a geometric flavor. Uh, and today we'll talk about more combinatorial or the discrete uh, result of the, the same time. Okay? So uh, this is what I call the necklace theorem. Let me first state uh, the case k equals two of it. Uh, uh, this was essentially uh, proved in some equivalent form in the continuous version by Hobby and Rice uh, as a result in L1 approximation. Uh, and in this form, uh, it first appears in a paper by uh, Goldberg and West, and, uh, uh, and a little bit later, we uh, found a, a very short proof uh, using a, a Borsukulam. And the statement is as follows. So suppose we have a necklace. It has beads of t different types. And let's assume that the number of beads of each type is even. So I denote it by 2 ai. We open the necklace at the clasp. So this is just an interval of beads. And then the claim is that we can cut the necklace in at most t places between beads so that we will get at most t plus one interval. And then we will be able to partition them into two collections in a completely fair way, namely each collection will contain exactly half of the beads of each type, AI beads of each type. And here you see a picture where we have a beads of a two types. Say we have a eight red beads and a six green beads. And you see that if uh, we cut in the two places that are marked here, and we give the first interval and the last interval, we put it in one collection, and the middle interval is in the second, then each collection contains exactly four red beads and exactly three green beads. Now, here is a general version. So, uh, 
So here we want k friction. So again, we have an open necklace, which is just an interval of beads. It has k times a i beads of type i for every i between 1 and t. So again, t is a number of times. And the number of beads of each type is divisible by k. Then the claim is that uh, it is always possible to cut the necklace in at most k minus 1 times t places and partition the resulting intervals into k collections, each containing exactly a i beads of phi i for every i. So in a completely fair way. And this k minus 1 times t is tight for all k and t. Uh, and the example, uh, one example shown with is example that you see uh, here. So if the beads of each type appear contiguously on the necklace, then just to cut this type into k non-empty parts, we have to have at least k minus one cuts inside the interval corresponding to each type. And therefore, altogether, we need at least k minus one times t cuts. And the statement here is that k minus one times t cuts are always sufficient. Now, one way to remember the uh, formulation is to think about a necklace that has been stolen, say, by k thieves. Uh, and these are not just any thieves, they are mathematically oriented thieves. And they want to distribute the necklace in a fair way among themselves. So they want that each of them will get exactly the same number of beads of each type. And they want to do it without using too many cuts. So the claim is that they can always do it, even if the necklace is very complicated, with k minus 1 times t cuts, where k is a number of thieves, t is a number of cuts. Uh, let me say something about the proof of it. Say, uh, I'll not talk much about it, but they uh, but I want to stress the fact that the proof in some sense is non-constructive. So there are two simple combinatorial steps in the proof. The first of them is to show that the validity of the statement for a group of K1 thieves and T types and a group of K2 thieves and T types implies the validity for the product for a group of K1 times K2 thieves and still t times. And this is simple, I'll not describe it, but, they, uh, but it's a simple argument. The second one is also not difficult, and this is to transform the problem into a continuous one. So a way to do it is uh, to replace each bead by a small interval of the corresponding color. Uh, and then we basically have an interval which is colored, or another way to think about it is that we have t probability measures if we normalize it on the same interval. And then we prove the continuous version. And we still have to show that the continuous version, uh, where we cut in k minus 1 times t places, uh, and so that the uh, uh, intervals can be partitioned into a fair ones according to these probability measures, then we have to show that if some of the cuts are inside some interval corresponding to a bead, then they can be shifted so that they lie on the border between intervals and uh, corresponding to beads. And, uh, and there is a simple argument that uh, shows that this can be done. And the main step is to prove the continuous version. And this uses topology. Uh, so specifically in the original proof, it uses an, a, a theorem of Baal and Schlossmann and Such, uh, a Borsuk type theorem. There are some similar results that uh, could be used uh, instead. And one uh, uh, interesting uh, feature of this uh, uh, topological proof is that it actually works only for prime number scale. So it is lucky that there is this first simple step that if we know it for K1 and for K2, we know it for the product, because then it's enough to prove it for primes. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, groups of thieves with a non-prime number of participants uh, might have had the problems. Uh, so the third 
part, the uh, main part, the topological one, is non-constructive in the sense that uh, uh, it does not provide an efficient algorithm for the problem. Uh, let me also mention that there are uh, at least two YouTube presentations uh, that uh, here you can see the titles that describe some aspects of, uh, of this proof. Uh, so I started to say uh, that uh, the proof is non-constructive in the sense that it does not provide an efficient, let's say polynomial time in the length of the necklace algorithm for finding the partition. So this is a, a question uh, that I want to raise, uh, speaking, starting to speak about the algorithmic uh, aspects. Uh, and this is, uh, can we find the k minus one cut? So we are given a necklace, it has bits of t types, it has k a i bits of each type, we know by the deterministic theorem that we, there is some set of k minus one times t cuts that suffices to partition the necklace fairly into k absolutely fair uh, parts. Can we actually find these cuts efficiently? And, uh, uh, and this is uh, not clear, definitely does not follow from the proof. Uh, and actually starting already in the uh, early 90s, I uh, mentioned this uh, uh, problem in several places. Uh, so I think it's interesting, even if you don't care about algorithm, because this is uh, maybe a way to check if the topology is essential here, because somehow the feeling is that maybe an alternative proof, a more combinatorial proof, uh, is more likely to be constructive to lead to an algorithm. But anyway, it's a, an interesting problem algorithmically. So we, we are talking about the algorithmic aspects, and there is a, a result uh, from two, three years ago by Aris Filostratzikas and Paul Goldberg. And what it says is that uh, for uh, k equals two, so two thieves, a problem that we can call the a, neck, this, a necklace uh, halving problem. So this uh, problem of finding a solution with T cuts, T is the bound that we know that always exists by the deterministic result with K equals two. This is what is called PPA complete. Now I'm not going to talk much about, uh, uh, about complexity classes. Uh, let me just mention that PPA is a complexity class introduced by Christos Papadimitriou. In the 90s, a, a PPA stands for a polynomial parity a, arguments. And this is a complexity class that deals with a, a complete NP problems, namely problems that always have a solutions. And we want to understand how difficult it is to actually find a solution. And uh, uh, as is always the case uh, with complexity theory, we don't really know to prove lower bounds for natural complexity classes, but we are very good in reductions. So we can show that some problems are as hard as some other problems. And PPA is a complexity class that contains uh, several interesting problems. Uh, we don't know to find uh, a solution efficiently to any of them. And if a problem is complete in this class, it means that if we can find a solution efficiently for this problem, then we can find solutions efficiently for all. And, uh, uh, and this problem is a uh, PPA uh, complete. Uh, so maybe it raises uh, naturally a problem of what can we do efficiently if we increase the number of cuts, if we allow ourselves a number of cuts that is a little bit bigger than T, say for K equals two. And, uh, uh, and this is this uh, recent result with uh, Andre uh, Grauer. So uh, what it uh, says is that this necklace having problem, the problem with two thieves and beads of T types, say, if we have at most M beads of each type, this can be solved efficiently 
using a number of cuts that grows with the length of the necklace, but it grows only mildly with the length of the necklace. Namely, the number of cuts will be T times log M plus a constant. So, uh, so this is some uh, algorithmic result and, uh, and this can be done efficiently. Uh, let me leave for a while the uh, algorithmic aspects and talk about random necklaces. So this is supposed to be a, a picture of a random necklace or a random collection uh, of beads. And, uh, uh, and here we want uh, uh, to understand what is happening if the necklace is random. Uh, so let me define some natural random model of necklaces. Uh, we have K thieves, T is again the number of types, and let's assume that we have exactly K times M beads of each type. So the total number of beads is K times M times T. And the open necklace N is just a uniform random permutations of these N beads. We take K and T beads, K M of them are of type I for every I, and we take a, a random uniform permutation of that. So then we can look for this necklace, what is the minimum number of cuts that suffice to generate a partition into K collections, each containing exactly M bits of each type. So this X is a random variable. It is denoted here by X of K, T and M. And we want to understand what is its typical value. So we know by the deterministic result that it is always at most k minus one times t, but maybe typically, or maybe with high probability, it is much smaller, right? So we want to uh, understand it. And we will be looking at the asymptotic uh, uh, version of the problem where at least one of the parameters, maybe more than one, tend to infinity. Okay? So this is a uh, so here are some results. Uh, this is in this uh, paper with uh, Elbow and May, Pach and Tardosh. So the first uh, result was not difficult is that for every fixed K and T, if the number of beads of each type tends to infinity, so large M and we have K M beads of each type, then we said that the Nisic theorem is that K minus one times T cuts are always enough. Uh, what is written here is that with high probability, namely with probability tending to one as a relevant parameter, M here tends to infinity, the required number of cuts is at least roughly half of it. So at least K minus one times T plus one over two. This is the first result. And in fact, the probability that a smaller number of cuts suffices. So if S is a number of cuts and S is a number which is smaller than k minus one t plus one over two, then the probability of that is what you see written uh, here, uh, namely it is a, a negative power of m. So it is a uh, decays to zero as m grows and it decays a, uh, as some fixed a negative power of m. Uh, this is both a, a upper and lower bound. Uh, uh, the bound uh, for the probability. Uh, so uh, if uh, k is two and I substitute in this result, then what I get is uh, t plus one over two. So with high probability, we need at least t plus one over two cuts. Uh, uh, then for odd t, we can consider a number of cuts that is exactly t plus one over two. And uh, the question is, what is the probability that this number of cuts suffices? Well, it turns out that this also decays to zero as M grows, but it decays uh, kind of mildly. The probability behaves like constant over log M, again, both upper and lower bound. Uh, now, let me call a partition of the positions of beads balanced if each part contains the right number of beads. Now we are not looking at the types of we just we are looking at the total number. And we call the partition fair if each part contains 
exactly the right number of leads of each type, exactly n beads of each type. And then what you've written here is a remark that for k equals two, the expected number of fair partitions by s cuts, this is something that is not difficult to check. This behaves like constant m to the s minus t plus one over two. So for s less than t plus one over two, this is a negative power of m and by Markov's inequality, the probability will be small. For s equals t plus one over two, this will be a constant. And by what I just said, the probability is only constant over log m. For s, which is bigger than t plus one over two, then we expect quite a lot of fair partitions. The expected number of partitions is, uh, is big. And then maybe it's natural to suspect, and this is what we believed for a while, that with high probability, we would already have a partition using say t plus three over two cuts or any number that is bigger than t plus one over two. But it turns out that this is not the case, uh, namely for every fixed S, which is strictly bigger than t plus one over two and is at most t, then the probability that for two thieves t types, two m beads of each type large m, then the probability that S cuts suffice is bounded away from zero and one for every fixed uh, S like that. So anything is possible. By the deterministic theorem, we know that T cuts always suffice, but it might be with a uh, probability bounded away from zero and one, uh, any number between T plus one over two and uh, T. Let's say. Now maybe uh, just uh, let me state uh, one result uh, when the fair share of each part is just one, namely we have exactly k beads of each type, uh, then there's a typical number of cuts required may be much smaller than the deterministic lower bound. And here is a statement, if t and k over log t, let's say both tend to infinity, then when we have k thieves, t types, and the number of beads of each type is k, so the fair share of beads of each type for each thief is exactly one. Then again, the deterministic result is k minus one times t cuts always suffice, but here with high probability, we need little of that, little of k t. Okay. So this is about results. And what I want to do in the remaining uh, 20 minutes or so, it's just to tell you a little bit about the uh, uh, proofs. And uh, I try to describe some part of the proof of the algorithm and then to sketch a special case of the result for uh, the random necklaces. And, uh, uh, and as I try to indicate, uh, uh, both use uh, uh, some uh, intriguing, I think, uh, ideas. Okay, so here is the algorithm again, uh, 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 or the statement of the existence of the algorithm, that the necklace having problem with beads of T types, and at most M beads of each type, can be solved efficiently using at most T log M plus constant cuts. So this is still significantly more than the deterministic results. It says it always are T cuts, but, uh, but this will be efficient. Okay. So here is the outline of the algorithm and uh, in some part of the proof, I'm not sure all of it. Okay. So first again, we want to uh, reduce the problem to a continuous one. We replace each bead by a small interval of its color. And this defines T probability measures on the say uh, interval zero one, as you see here, we would have the red measure and the blue measure and the uh, yellow measure and the light blue uh, measure and we normalize each of them to be probability measures. Uh, so we have now these measures. And now for any interval i inside this interval zero one, let me denote by p1 of i, p2 of i up to p sub t of i, this will be the t measures of this interval, the measure of this interval according to each of the probability measures that we have. 
And let me have a, a global uh, measure. This will be P of I. This will be just the sum of all the measures of a given interval. So P of the whole interval 0, 1 is exactly T, right? Because each of them is a probability measure and we sum all of them. Now, what we can do is that we can use 2t minus 1 cuts to split 0, 1 into a collection, C, I call it here, of 2t intervals, where the p measure of each of them is half, because the total measure of everything was t, and we just split it to 2t equal parts. And notice that it's easy to do this efficiently, right, because each probability measure is uniform on its support when we want to, uh, uh, to find this uh, uh, split, it's very easy to do it. And now for each interval, and in particular for each interval in C, but uh, for each interval uh, uh, in general, let me denote by uh, uh, if J is interval, Vj will be the T vector, vector of length T, which measures the measure of uh, uh, the coordinates are the measure of j according to each of the t probability measures. Okay, so this is this interval. And note that what we really want is we want to generate a collection of not too many disjoint intervals so that the sum of their vectors, these vectors corresponding to these intervals will be, well, ideally, we want it to be exactly the vector half, 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 namely its measure according to each of the measures is exactly one half. But what I say here is that it will be enough to be very close to that, so to be within distance one over two M in the L infinity norm from this vector, because then there is a simple argument to round it uh, and to get uh, an exact partition. So this is what we want. And, uh, and this looks actually like a problem in discrepancy theory. So it is natural that we would try to use uh, some of the techniques that are being used in discrepancy theory. And this is indeed what is uh, being used. So uh, I'll not describe exactly uh, what we are doing here. We follow some uh, linear algebra argument. So basically this will use Carathew-Dory theorem for cones. It uh, is really like a problem in discrepancy theory, but, uh, but it's some sort of a dynamic problem in the sense that we are allowed to change the vectors because we will keep making cuts. And whenever we make a cut, we get a, a new vector. A, and if we do it carefully, then we get the result. And, uh, uh, and as I said, I did not intend to give all the details. I just saw, show you that uh, they kind of uh, appear here. So there are some uh, steps. And all the steps are efficient. They just do some linear algebra uh, manipulation, so basically solving some systems of uh, equations, uh, uh, of linear equations uh, several times. And uh, uh, like uh, all the proofs, it goes uh, uh, with some arguments. At, at the end, we are saying uh, QED. So I apologize that I'm not giving the, uh, the arguments, but uh, uh, this can be found uh, uh, in the papers that is uh, uh, in my web page and uh, in the uh, internet. Uh, so I want to uh, switch gears and uh, to talk a little bit uh, about uh, one proof of special case of the result uh, uh, for random matrices. Uh, and, uh, and what I'll talk about is the case of two thieves, k equals two, three types, t equals three, in large M. So we denoted before this uh, corresponding random variable by x, 2, 3, and m. And the claim is that this x, 2, and 3, uh, m is 1. So 1 cut suffices with probability essentially 1 over m. That would be easy. The interesting part is that 2 cut suffice with probability 1 over log m. 
up to a constant, and three, of course, with a remaining probability, because the deterministic theorem tells us that for two thieves and t types, t cuts are always enough. So we want to talk about the uh, proof of this, and again, I'm just repeating it uh, with a picture here, two thieves, three types, large M, then the number of cuts needed is one with probability one over M, two is probability one over log M, three with the remaining probability. And uh, uh, I wrote here that it really suffices to show that the probability that two cuts are enough behaves like one over log M because to show, uh, to compute the probability for one cut is essentially trivial. I mean, we have this interval of weeds. We have only one possibility to do one cut. So it has to be exactly in the middle. And then we compute the probability that it is balanced and, uh, and this is easy. We know that three cuts are always enough. So the only question is uh, uh, when are two cuts enough? And, uh, and I want to show you uh, something about, uh, about the proof. Uh, uh, so there would be a, an upper bound and a lower bound. Uh, so let me uh, first uh, look at this necklace again. So the necklace is an interval of six M beads, two M of each type, two M red, two M blue, and two M green. Here is a picture of a necklace. Let's close it now. It doesn't matter really uh, because the number of cuts we are considering is even then you can convince yourself that a, a closed necklace and an open necklace are the same. So really we have this uh, circle of a, or necklace of six M beads, two M of each type, and we call a cyclic interval of length three M fair if it contains exactly M beads of each type, like the cyclic interval that you see here is fair because it contains exactly two beads of each of the three types. And because the length of the interval is right, then it will be fair even only if it contains the right number of red beads and the right number of blue beads, because then it will automatically contain also the right number of green beads. Okay, so let me denote uh, by y of the necklace, this natural random uh, uh, variable, this will be the number of fair cyclic intervals of length 3m in the necklace. So this is just a random variable counting the number of cyclic intervals that are fair. And we can compute the expectation of y and can compute the expectation of y square. Both are not difficult to do, I'll not do it here. It turns out that the expectation of y is a constant, uh, so some, uh, some constant uh, numbers that does not uh, change with, uh, with m. And the expectation of y square behaves like constant log m. So because of this, by the uh, pali zygmunt inequality, which is basically just a uh, Cauchy-Schwarz, we know that the probability that y is positive, this is what we care, right? Uh, two cuts suffice, even on the if y is positive. There is some cyclic interval that is fair. So the probability that y is positive is at least the square of the expectation of y divided by the expectation of y squared. This is by using one. And this is constant one over log m. So this is the lower bound. It's uh, uh, not too difficult. There is some computation that I omitted, but, uh, uh, but this is uh, uh, the easy part. So the upper bound is uh, more interesting. And I want to uh, show you uh, the basic argument because the interesting thing is that uh, uh, it's related to some properties of a two-dimensional standard random walk. So, so here is a, uh, the argument. We would want to show that the probability that y, this random variable counting the number of fair cyclic intervals, the probability that it is positive is small. Well, is it most one over log m? So the way to do it is to define another random variable. This is z, I'll soon read what, what is its definition. And to show that if y is positive, then z is also very likely to be positive. But the probability that z is positive is very small. Behaves like one over log m and this would prove what we want, okay? 
So what is this random variable z of n? So it's again the number of cyclic fair intervals in the necklace, but they don't only have to be fair, but it, they also have to satisfy that when we shift this interval, say clockwise, by any shift, which is at most m to the one quarter, this is some arbitrary choice, then we don't want to get any additional fair interval. So again, uh, this is the number of fair intervals, z, so that whenever we shift them clockwise by not too much, then they don't give us another fair interval. Now, the thing to observe is that the expectation of y, I told you, the number of fair intervals is a constant, is O of 1. And therefore, the probability it is large, it exceeds, say, m to the 3 quarters, is by Markov only m to the minus 3 quarters, which is very small. And the thing to observe is that uh, if y is positive, namely there is some cyclic interval, and z is 0, then there is this fair cyclic interval, but z is 0, so we can shift it clockwise by less than m to the 1 quarter beads and get another fair interval. And we can shift this other fair interval by not more than m to the 1 quarter and get yet another fair interval, and so on. So altogether, if y is positive and z is 0, then we need at least m to the 3 quarters fair intervals. But the probability to get this is very small because the expectation of y is a constant. So this is supposed to convince us that if y is positive, then z is also very likely to be positive. So it remains to show that the probability that z is positive is only constant 1 over log n at most. And this is proved by applying basically classical argument about the standard two-dimensional random walk. Okay. So the original argument uh, is due to Dvoretsky and Derdesh. If we are doing a random walk in the two-dimensional plane, starting from the origin, and every step goes uh, along one of the coordinate x's, so it's either plus one in the x-coordinate or minus one or the same in the y-coordinate, then this random walk, it's well known that it's uh, recurrent, namely it, with probability one, if it's an infinite random walk, it will return to the origin infinitely many times. And therefore, if we go a long time, then it is likely to return to the origin. And in fact, you can prove, so it's a nice argument, that if you go for S steps, the probability that you, starting from the origin, the probability that you never return to the origin during these S steps behaves like constant 1 over log S. And there are very accurate uh, estimates. The exact constant is known, and even the error terms are known, but uh, we don't care about this. Now, in our case, there is also a relevant two-dimensional random walk. So this is the following. We have an interval. When we shift it by one clockwise, the vector of the numbers of the number of red beads, the number of blue beads in the interval can change by either 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on. All the possibilities that, that you see here with the probabilities that are written here, I soon have a picture. And the probabilities are nearly independent for a sequence of m to the one quarter steps. They are not quite independent because we know that the number of beads of each type is exactly 2m. But if we don't go too many steps, then no matter what we've seen, then still the probabilities stay very close to what uh, they've been in the beginning. So here is an example. If we have this uh, uh, cyclic interval that you see here, which is in this picture indeed a, a fair or balanced. Uh, then if we shift it uh, clockwise like this, then the vector of red blue changes by one zero, right? Because the number of uh, red 
beads increased by one and the number of blue beads didn't change. We lost the green bead, okay? And the same thing holds for any sheaf like that. Now it turns out that the Dvoretsky Erdish argument can be uh, adapted uh, to apply to this walk, which is a, a little bit different than a standard random walk, but uh, similar enough to it. And this shows that uh, the random variable Z, which starts with a fair cyclic interval, and we want it for M to the one quarter steps, we will not get another fair interval. So this can be viewed as starting from the origin, and we want that we never go back to the origin, and the probability of that is, con is at most a constant one over log m, and this basically gives a double okay. So, uh, so hopefully, even if you uh, did not follow the uh, argument exactly, the uh, flavor is clear, and uh, uh, and the conclusion is that the the random variable y, which is one we care about, it counts the number of a fair cyclic interval, it is positive with probability one over log n, and this shows that the probability is that the two cuts suffice behaves like one over log n. Let me finish by mentioning two challenges. There are several open problems here, but, uh, but here are two that uh, uh, look particularly interesting, I think. Uh, uh, so the first of them is uh, we can see is it the algor an algorithmic question. Uh, we consider the necklace having problem. So T types, two thieves. We know that T cuts are enough. We can find efficiently something like T log M cuts. The question or the challenge is to find an efficient algorithm for solving the problem using a number of cuts bounded by a function of t only that does not grow with the length of the necklace. Those results that I mentioned about PPA hardness or PPA completeness of the problem, they are hard even if we allow a little bit more than t cuts. So t plus t to the 0.99, for example, is still PPA hard, but, uh, but it could be that uh, t square or two to the t uh, cuts uh, could be found efficiently. We don't know to do it and it will be uh, interesting. And one challenge about uh, uh, the random necklace. So let's consider this special case of the parameters. Two thieves, again, we want to split it to two T types and exactly, uh, exactly two beads of each type. So what we really want is that uh, each of the thieves will get exactly one bead of each type. So we have altogether two T beads, two of each type, and we want to cut it and split it into two collections, each containing exactly one bead of each type. What is the minimum number of cuts we need? Typically for random necklace. So by some Martingale inequalities, it can be shown that uh, uh, with high probability, the value of this random variable is within distance roughly square root t of its expectation. So we really care about the expectation. Now a first moment computation would show that uh, with high probability, we need at least something like 0.22 times t cuts, so some number, and then uh, we have some arguments that uh, we found together with uh, Ryan Elwise, say, uh, Colin Defante, Noah Kravitz, uh, who are all uh, uh, students in Princeton. So we could show that uh, something like 0.4 T cuts are enough with high probability. So we can ask about the uh, right constant here. And uh, I believe that finding the right constant is a very difficult problem. So both the 0.22 and the 0.4 can be slightly improved, but, uh, but I think that finding the right constant will be very uh, difficult. But, uh, but even more frustrating is that we don't know that this constant exists at all. So this is a question that I wanted to mention. 
does the limit of the ratio of expectation of the number of cuts needed divided by t as t tends to infinity, does this limit exist? Now, of course it exists, I'm sure it exists, but can we prove that it exists? And we don't know to do it. And uh, if we can prove that it exists, of course, uh, maybe it will be interesting to find it, but, uh, but just proving existence uh, by some sort of uh, monotonicity or subadditivity or some such argument, uh, this uh, uh, would also be interesting and, uh, uh, and is also open. And with this, I'll uh, finish and uh, thank you. Thanks.